We're speaking with Gary Alexander, who, in addition to being a great clarinetist, is also a musicologist. And you're in the process of writing a book. What's the, the premise of this essay? Well, the, the essay is intended as an introduction to the book, which I would call Beauty and the Beat, how the sons of Tevye and the grandchildren of slaves joined to create the greatest uh, 20th century American music, which I label as the Great American Songbook and Jazz, and the combination of the two and how they interacted with each other. Okay. Um, what's the connection between the Great American Songbook, which is, of course, is not a single songbook, but a how would you describe it? Okay, the songbook, which most people call the Great American Songbook, came about in the half century between 1914 and maybe 1964, when the cream of the greatest songwriters were at, at their peak, and that would include George Gershwin, of course, Harold Arlen, Irving Berlin, Jerome Kern, and of course, they're all Eastern European first or second generation Jewish immigrants to America. And that is an underlying theme. There are a few, you know, native-born Americans without Jewish uh, background, like Cole Porter or Hoagie Carmichael. But I would say about 70 to 80 percent of the great songwriters in that era were Eastern European second or first generation immigrants to America. Uh huh. But when they were uh, writing this music, did they have jazz in mind? No. In most cases, not. There was a certain blues element to the music of Harold Arlen, and there was rhythmic element and blues element to George Gershwin. But people like Jerome Kern wrote in the standard, uh, you would call it art song tradition of a Schubert, uh, more so than a jazz tradition. And uh, Irving Berlin combined the two. He could put rhythm in a ragtime situation, or he could write beautiful music. He was very uh, capable in both areas. Uh, but jazz came later, and m many of the great American songwriters did not like the jazz versions of their music, Richard Rodgers notably in Irving Berlin. However, Harold Arlen and George Gershwin were rhythmic oriented and loved the jazz versions of their tunes. Did it take black artists to turn these uh, Tin Pan Alley songs into jazz? or, or uh, how did the jazz versions evolve? Okay, the way the jazz version evolved, the way I see it, Louis Armstrong and other jazz uh, musicians came up from the South, born in the South, but could not make their music widespread internationally or even nationally from the South. They had to come to New York, Chicago, and so forth. But they took the standards, like Louis Armstrong would, his first recording of a standard was I Can't Give You Anything But Love Baby, written by a Dorothy Field, she wrote the lyrics, and Jimmy McHugh wrote the music. Mm -hmm. And then he performed Ain't Misbehavin by Fats Waller and Dinah, and these uh, songs that were very popular in the time, and he uh, put a jazz flavor to them, both in the trumpet and in his unique vocal stylings. Mm -hmm. uh, were there uh, Jewish songwriters who played jazz? I would imagine so. I, I, I don't think that's the specialty that either one of them focused on. In other words, at first the Jewish composers did not think of themselves as jazz musicians. George Gershwin is the closest to it, but he wrote it out. He wrote out variations on I Got Rhythm uh -huh. uh, rather than uh, improvising. I imagine in private parties he would improvise, but he was most noted as a composer who wrote down his variations. Uh -huh. When you say he wrote down the, vari uh, wrote down the variations, on piano, the, the, he wrote his own improvisations? Yes. In fact, there's a long symphonic piece called Variations on I Got Rhythm. But he, he wrote the, uh, the, you can buy them in, in uh, music stores anywhere. What he wrote were his elaborations on the melodies of some of his more famous compositions. And they're not considered sheet music. There are elaborations upon the original tune. Yeah. Y your essay is called How the Sons of Tevye. Uh, What's your familiarity with the character of Tevye? <laughs> well, thank you for asking. I played Tevye in a community production of Fiddler on the Roof in 2008. We had eight performances in one week. It's an entirely draining experience and thrilling in that Tevye's in every scene but two, and there are 18 scenes, and he sings 15 songs, and speaks 5,000 words, and he speaks to God and man with, with equal eloquence. Mm -hmm. It was a role of a lifetime for me. But the com connection that I make is that uh, Tevye uh, and Golda had five daughters, no sons. Mm -hmm. And when I say sons of Tevye, I'm speaking quite literally of Irving Berlin, mm -hmm. who was born into a family with five older sisters. Mm -hmm. And then he came along as the sixth child, and they 
didn't have three days warning to mm -hmm. leave Anatevka like uh, like uh, Tevya did. Their homes were burned down in the middle of the night, Easter of 1893, when young Izzy, Balin is his name then, mm -hmm. was uh, only five years of age and it took them like six months to make it to America. So he was, in a very analogous sense, uh, the son of Tevya. Mm -hmm. How about uh, the Klezmers who came to New York? Do you address that? Oh yeah, klezmer music actually resembles in many ways New Orleans polyphonal jazz, especially the swooping sound of the clarinet in klezmer music. Mm -hmm. The Pale of Settlement music from the Jewish tradition is much freer than uh, the standard symphonic tradition in Russia, and it, it felt at home to play that kind of music in a jazzy style in New York City and, and elsewhere. Yes. Uh -huh. What were Louis Armstrong's uh, Yiddish roots? <laughs> well, actually, now that you mention it, he was very thankful to the person who gave him the trumpet, who was a Jewish musical store owner. I forget his name. I think it's Wersheim or something along that line. Mm -hmm. And Louis spoke uh, just very favorably of this Jewish family that supported him in his youth in New Orleans. Yeah. Uh -huh. was, he was, no was he known to speak Yiddish? No, I don't think so. I don't know or that much. Or a couple it. of phrases. Probably so. Do you know more about this than me? Go ahead and tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to know something as an interviewer. I'm not Charlie Rose. Uh, and by that, I mean knowing nothing about a subject that I like to uh, claim authority to. Um, but the, the klezmer style, is that something you think that, that Louis may have integrated into his playing style? Yeah, it could have been, but it's more of a clarinet style. There aren't trumpets that I know of in klezmer music. In the original uh, setting, uh, is there? Isn't it more uh, uh, fiddle music and uh, clarinet? I ha mean, what is the general instrumentation? Uh, well, uh, well, well, clarinet and fiddle and uh, maybe a, a, a tambourine uh, mm -hmm. or a trombone. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, how about uh, Benny Goodman? Does he figure into this uh, transition? Right. Uh, Benny Goodman and Artie Shaw are both, as I mentioned before, second generation. Jewish families, uh, and uh, Ar Arthur Arshosky was Artie Shaw's original name. And uh, of course, Artie brought in the uh, sound of the swooping clarinet that it used uh, in Gershwin's introduction to Rhapsody in Blue, mm -hmm. whereas Benny Goodman had, uh, I think, more of the klezmer style in, in his playing, though, than Artie Shaw. Uh huh. Uh, did Benny Goodman represent uh, a, a Jewish style in any of his o other uh, hits that he would introduce to the uh, swing oh, scene? Well, by Mirabis Duchesne, I mean, uh, and uh, Ziggy Elman is trumpet player, Jewish, and they took, uh, what was it, Froelich and turned it into And the Angels Sing, a hit for uh, Martha Tilton in 1938. That came directly from, uh, from the klezmer tradition, yeah. Uh, how about uh, Don't Be That Way? Oh, that's a song. I, I believe that uh, Alice, his wife, told him that, Benny, don't be that way. And so they wrote a song along that line. Yeah, it became a big hit. Uh, is this book already written? No, it's not. Unfortunately, I still uh, work for a living and can't, uh, can't write as much of this as I want to, but it's all written up here. Uh -huh. You've got to trust me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, can people uh, follow uh, your writings in short and... Uh, article? Well, I would like them to hear my radio show, which is really kind of the rough draft of the book, because I go through the composers in great detail on KLOI, which is a radio that can be uh, streamed live audio, www.kloi.org. And I'm on live uh, Friday and Monday afternoons from 3 to 6, going through the songbook series. Is that specific time? Yes, Pacific time, mm -hmm. uh, 3 to 6 p.m., Friday and Monday. Are archives available online? Uh, no, they're not because we pay a one-time fee to ASCAP and there, is, uh, there are rules and regulations for unlimited play and they won't allow unlimited play of archives. So your show is sort of like jazz. It's only there when it's being played and... It's in the moment, yes. And I don't write out my scripts, although I do research each program quite uh, thoroughly. Do you have your own website too? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> but if I'm people one of the few people on earth who doesn't. Well, not yet, not yet anyway. <laughs> what, uh, we're here at the uh, at Freedom Fest show. How did this, you just gave a panel about jazz, what was it called? 
Beauty and the Beat. It's the name I gave it. And how did Freedom Fest happen to have a jazz panel? Mark and Joanne Skousen, who, who formed this uh, festival, actually they started it 15 years ago, but independently owned it from the last 10 years, always wanted music here. In a previous seminar, we did uh, musical theater together, 1776 and Camelot, and they're, they're musical and they're interested in music. And I gave a speech at another conference on the history of jazz, and they really liked it so much they asked me to repeat it here at the Freedom Fest. Uh-huh. Uh, do you suppose the audience of Freedom Fest has any connection of appreciation to jazz? The audience of the Freedom Fest is primarily interested in politics and economics, I must tell you. But we want to address the whole person, the whole idea of human endeavor. In other words, why do you want freedom and why do you, why do you want uh, to pursue your, your heart's dream in a land like America unless you're doing something that adds to the culture, not just uh, being free, free to do what? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, so that we cover all of the arts and literature and, and music here at Freedom Fest. There's always music at the closing concert as well, closing banquet. Thank you very much for speaking with us sure. today. My pleasure.